middle school because we feel it is important to inform students of the negative impacts drugs can have on someone's life. Hopefully you all remember the great assembly we had last year. We usually have this assembly during Red Ribbon Week to kick off our Cool to Be Clean club here at the middle school. As most of you probably know, CDBC's mission is to promote staying clean and making positive decisions. Each day we make hundreds of choices, what to eat or drink, whether or not to cheat on homework, do I study for my test or play Fortnite. We make decisions based on what we've seen from our parents, teachers, siblings, and friends. Now that we are in the middle school, we are faced with more important decisions, choices that our parents and teachers can't control anymore. Things like drugs, al alcohol, relationships, etc. We make our own decisions. We either reap the benefits or suffer the consequences. CWC's mission is to recognize each other for making good choices, for being clean of bad choices. Many of you sitting here today are already members of CTBC. Just a reminder, CTBC members are those of us who are, more, who are effective role models for our school community. Those who set positive examples of a good friend, a good student, and a good citizen of Peters Township. This goes beyond the school walls. Teachers and parents do not always have the opportunity to see who we are and all the decisions we make on each day, but our friends might. This is where C2BC comes in. C2BC is a student-led program we, where we recognize our peers for making good choices. We are getting older and starting to make bigger decisions, so we need facts and information to help us make better choices. Today, we have the opportunity to talk about staying clean in the sense of what drugs can do to us and our bodies. Our counseling department has brought in several guests involved with C2BC. Senator Guy Reschenthaler, the State Senator of the 37th District, Mr. Phil Little, a specialist from PA Attorney General's Office, Mr. Eric Berkheimer, a National Business Development Representative for Buy-In Treatment Center and is here to share his experience with w drugs and why he made the decision to get clean. At this time, we would like to invite Senator Reschenthaler to the stage. Well, thanks for inviting me here today, and thanks for coming. You know, um, I've been doing a lot of these programs, and a lot of people ask me, you know, what are you doing in the state legislature to solve the problem? And we can try to legislate morality as much as we can, but at the end of the day, the only thing that can really stop this program is empowering you so when you're confronted with the choice to use drugs, that you have the ability to say no. And I think that ability comes through having a lot of information, so that's why we're here. Before I introduce Special Agent Phil Little, I just wanna really say that so many of the cases I had come before me when I was a district judge, and so many of the cases I had when I was a defense attorney, the root cause of that problem was really drug use. So people may have been coming before me uh, for shoplifting or for domestic violence, but a lot of times, really, it was all because of some kind of issue pertaining to drugs. So I wanna introduce our next guest, Special Agent Phil Little. The Attorney General's office is like the FBI of the state of Pennsylvania, top law enforcement agency in the state. So with that said, it's an honor to introduce my friend, Special Agent Phil Little. All right, round two, right? You got it. All right, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, First and foremost, I want to thank me. the uh, Peters Township School District for inviting me in here today, as well as uh, Senator Reschenthaler for that warm introduction. Um, let me again, let me introduce myself. My name's Phil Little. I, I'm a specialist with the Pennsylvania Office of the Attorney General. Uh, show of hands real quick. Has anyone ever heard of our office before? A few hands go up. Uh, and here's the thing. I ask that question often, anywhere I go, because I have the responsibility, as Senator Reschenthaler said, our office is the chief law enforcement agency, like the FBI of the state, representing that agency, being the face of that agency uh, throughout half the Commonwealth here in Pennsylvania. I have the responsibility of coming into schools much like this one right here we're standing in and talking to students much like yourselves on a number of different subjects. And one thing's become incredibly apparent uh, throughout my travels. And that is that a lot of people really haven't heard of our office, and that's okay. But to easily explain, again, what our office is and what we do, uh, we are the chief law enforcement agency working with your local police, state police, on a 
number of different initiatives to keep people safe here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Easiest, stead, eas easiest said, uh, we are much like your FBI. So just to give you a better idea of what our office is and what we do. Now, obviously, we just uh, were finishing up Red Ribbon Week here, which I have the privilege of, of participating in numerous school districts' Red Ribbon Weeks throughout the, uh, throughout the Commonwealth here. And, and this is my last speech uh, the, for this year participating in Red Ribbon Week, so it is special. But since we're talking about drugs, I, I think it's incredibly and, and, and important to explain that in the time that I'm going to share with you here speaking, I'm never going to tell you and give you the speech that drugs are bad. Because how many of you have heard that speech countless times in your life? Show of hands real quick. It's my point. We know that already. I'm not going to waste your time. You know that. There's no point in repeating that to you. You see, what I do want to talk to you about, though, is something that our students up here talked about prior to me stepping up to this podium something far more simple. It's choices. And as the student said prior to me walking up here was that life is full of choices. What am I going to do after school? Who am I going to hang out with? Am I going to play Fortnite, right? Those are the choices that we make. And here's the thing, though. While the choices that we have made in our lives and our young lives have been pretty simple, we are now at a pivotal point in our lives, that the choices that we make when they pertain to certain subjects, such as alcohol and drugs, have a lifelong lasting impact. That's what I want to talk to you today about, and really relating it to something that I call uh, the snowball effect. So show hands real quick. How many of you ever heard of this term, the snowball effect? Almost every hand's up in here, right? So we, we get that concept. For those of you that don't, it's very simple. The snowball effect is that there's a snowball on top of a hill. It starts out very small. Now, that snowball is always a representative of something. And in this case, it's addiction. And the snowball starts rolling based on choices that we've done. And the next choice leads into another choice, into another choice. And that snowball gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And all based off of just one small choice at the top, that small little snowball, has now become a gigantic boulder rolling down the hill, out of control, causing destruction in its path anywhere it goes. That's what I want to talk to you today about. Based on those choices, that snowball effect can trigger being addiction in our lives. So the big thing, though, is the, the small choices we often don't think about. And one of the big things that I am seeing throughout the Commonwealth here in our office is that it's really pertaining to small choices, not thinking it's dangerous, being prescription drugs and opioids. So show of hands here, how many of you have heard of those terms? Opioids, prescription drugs, painkillers, things of that nature. Great, so we're on the same page. The reality of it is, while they are legal, under the right supervision, under the doctor's care and, and following those directions, there's a place in this world for us to have them and to use them properly. Unfortunately, though, when abused, they become uh, a medicine or, or abused being a pill or drug that causes mass destruction and can downright kill people. I, I really want to share with you some information, though, based on what I'm talking about today with some numbers to really help illustrate my point. You see, when we talk about prescription drugs and opioids, what we really need to understand is how much of a killer they are. In fact, when you ask someone how much or what drug kills the most amount of people per year, you're often going to hear things such as heroin, cocaine, things of that nature. And while those are great guesses, they're just simply not true. It's actually prescription drugs. And in fact, they kill more people than heroin and cocaine can bind do in one year. When you think about prescription drugs and opioids, we don't think of them as being killers. But in reality, they kill 300% more people than I realize is the relationship between legal prescription opioids and things like fentanyl and heroin are a very close relationship. It's a very, very close relationship that a legal drug is closely linked to that nasty illicit drug that we know tears apart communities all over our commonwealth and our nation. 
I want to share with you why that is. Here in a moment, you're going to hear testimony from a man, uh, a gentleman, who's an incredibly brave hero sharing his story. Uh, I truly do believe that. And I don't believe you're probably going to remember a thing I'm going to tell you because of how powerful and gripping his story is. And I'm okay with that because that's the real lesson that we're going to hear here in a moment. But I want to share with you a very interesting situation that, that I've been experiencing throughout my time at the Office of the Attorney General in dealing with the snowball effect. I've had the privilege of meeting countless people in drug rehab facilities battling drug addiction through all out the Commonwealth. And every single person that I meet, I, I ask the same questions. Tell me how you got here, and tell me when you realized addiction was an, was an issue in your life. Something very remarkable started to happen. It didn't matter if I was here in Washington County, Allegheny County, Erie County to the north, or all the way out in Center County where Penn State is. A very, very strange phenomenon started to happen. That while the names and the stories they would tell me would change and the towns they grew up in would change, the way that they got there and, and the real key points of their story were almost always the same. And, and none of these people knew each other. So to really illustrate that in the snowball effect, I asked that question. I'm going to share with you a, the abbreviated story of it. I would say, again, tell me how you got here. Tell me when addiction became an issue. And this is what people would often tell me. They'd say, Phil, look, it's not like one day I just woke up and I said, you know, I think I'm just going to use heroin. It doesn't work like that. Looking back now, I realized that addiction started with choices that I made back in late middle school, early high school, which is the age level you are at right now. And what it started with wasn't hard drugs that everyone thinks of, but it was the things that were around. I'd drink with my friends, or I'd, I'd use marijuana, and I was okay, though. It wasn't like that my grades were slipping, my parents were kicking me out of my house, and I was losing friends left and right. So I didn't think it was an issue. But looking back now, I realized that that started, that little insignificant decision that I thought was insignificant at least, started the ball rolling of addiction in my life. Because since I was good using those substances, when my friend got a hold of an opioid named Vicodin, I thought I'd be okay using that because I was okay using other substances. But the issue was that I wasn't once I started using. I became addicted. And it became something that controlled my life that I had to use on a daily basis. And it got to the point where I couldn't use any more pills or find any more, but my body craved and I'd go through withdrawal. I only had one choice. And it wasn't because I wanted to use heroin to, to, to get high, like pe many people say. It was because I didn't want to be sick and go through withdrawal. It was a fraction of the cost. And before I knew it, that simple decision that started at the top led me where I am here today, telling you that story. I told you I was not going to sit here and tell you that drugs are bad. You know that. This comes down to making the right choices. And as Senator Reschenthaler often mentions, is that the choices that we make are ours and ours alone to make. I'm not going to be there when you have to make those tough decisions, nor is he or the adults in your life. The only people that are going to be there when you have to make those decisions are you. I urge you, make those right choices to make that investment in your future so we don't have these issues ruining lives, ruining families, and ruining communities. Thank you so much. When kicking off the C2BC program, we find it very powerful to hear from someone who has made some negative choices in the past and how they have had an impact on his life. Please welcome Mr. Eric Berkheimer. How you guys doing? Good. Thank God it's Friday, right? 
How many, uh, how many of you guys are looking forward to a weekend full of uh, books? Listen, books, studying, and helping your parents out around the house. All right, that's what I, all right. So, uh, again, it's a pleasure to be here, guys. Um, it, 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 for me, it's, you know, uh, it, it's a miracle, you know, for me to be up here. Um, I, uh, like I said, my name is Eric Berkheimer. Um, I, uh, I was a middle schooler, like you guys, 25 years ago. You know, I say that and you know, start to realize how old I'm getting. Um, but uh, I, uh, again, uh, it's kind of comical when I, when I hear the young lady talk about negative choices. You know, my mind tells me, well, you know, just, I made ju just a few, you know, that lasted, uh, you know, almost uh, three decades of my life. Um, so, you know, a little bit about me. I, um, you know, I grew up in a town called Weirton, West Virginia, which is about an hour from here. Um, actually grew up on the same street as Bianca. And, um, you know, I grew up in a, in a, in a good home, um, you know, from the outside looking in. You know, we had everything we wanted and more. Um, I, I never went without. Um, you know, probably was raised with a little bit of, a, you know, an, an entitlement um, that probably didn't, you know, uh, help me out later in life. Um, but, uh, you know, when we're here, we're talking about drugs and alcohol and, and, and the effects and, you know, where, where it can take you. And, um, you know, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about, you know, where it took me. And um, so, I, you know, my, my, my introduction to, you know, substances, if you will, um, you know, I remember, you know, I remember being six years old, you know, and, uh, you know, I grew up in a, uh, an alcoholic family. You know, I mean, uh, you know, functional in every respect. You know, my, my mother and father drank, you know, but they worked. You know, they were great providers, you know, but, you know, they partied, you know, they, they went out on the weekends, you know, with their friends and, you know, alcohol was always around. Now, I was fortunate, you know, that, you know, I, you know, I didn't grow up in a household where, you know, drugs were around, you know, but, but alcohol was bad enough, you know, and, it, and alcohol was my, like, like almost like a normal. Um, but I remember being six years old and, and like I had shared with the group earlier, I don't remember, you know, I, I can't remember it that, that alcohol was like, you know, giving me an effect at that time. But the thing that I remembered is, you know, my dad would have a bunch of his buddies over, you know, to watch football games or basketball games. Sports were real big in my family. Um, and I remember going around to each of my dad and, and his buddies and just getting sips, you know, getting little sips of beer. And, um, and the thing that I do remember about that time that um, played a bigger part in my life as I grew up is... Um, I was a part of, and, and, and that's, that's a common theme when you're growing up. You know, I think a lot of us, just from a, from a human nature standpoint, you know, we want to be part of something. You know, we want to be liked. We want, you know, we want to be, you know, looked at well by our peers. Um, you know, we want to fit in. You know, we, you know, so all these things that we experience growing up, you know, that some of us just, you know, just lack tools and resources and, and really um, the courage to speak up when, 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 you're, when you're not feeling like you can handle these things. You know, and that's, that's one of the things that I encourage all you guys to do, you know, as, as you, you know, progress through your, your life, is if, if something doesn't feel right inside, grab someone and talk to them about it. You know, our, our whole world is, you know, on our phones these days. You know, and, you know, face-to-face -face interaction is, is diminishing. So, you know, I encourage you guys, is if, if something's going on at home or, you know, something doesn't feel right, or, or you got that recurrent theme in your mind saying that, you know, I don't add up or, or uh, I'm not good enough, it's, it's, it's BS. Go talk to someone, guys. Um, so I go through grade school, you know, not really doing anything, you know, too crazy. I mean, I was definitely, um, I was definitely misbehaved, and I think I'll keep it at that, you know, in the grade school. You know, I was definitely class clown. Um, you know, um, but I excelled in sports. You know, that, that's the one thing that, you know, when I, when I was introduced to this world, I think all my decisions were made at, at age three um, about where my life was going to go. You know, my, my mother was a very kind, loving person, um, still is. My father, my father didn't uh, get raised in a very good child, childhood, and, 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 you know, his father was rough with him. So that's all he knew to give me. So, so from the time I was born, you know, I was going to be an athlete. You know, that, that was going to be the path that was laid out for me. And, you know, my father, um, you know, growing up in grade school, you know, basketball, baseball, football, and soccer, those are my four sports that I played. Um, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't fun. 
it was, it was a job. You know what I mean? Like, to the point where, like, if, if I didn't excel in a game, you know, and I wasn't the best player, I wasn't a standout in, in each respective sports, then there was, there was contention between me and my father. And, 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 and the feelings that I had about that is, you know, I just wanted my father to tell me that he loved me. And I just wanted my father to, to say, that a boy. You know, and I just wanted, to, I wanted that acceptance from my father that for whatever reason I didn't get. And I remember getting to middle school and um, experimentation comes, you know. And, and in my days, guys, you know, I didn't have the, the concerns and fears, or at least it, it felt like it about you guys, you know, about with, you know, heroin and painkillers and all these prescription medications that essentially, you know, could kill you with one use. You know, it just didn't seem like those were my issues in middle school. You know, my issues were, you know, alcohol and marijuana, you know. And I remember, the, you know, the first times that I started using these um, these drugs, I remember how it made me feel. All the insecurity, all the fear, all the anxiety, you know, all the, the worry about fitting in were gone. We're gone. And it was like my mind told me, was like, that's my answer, right? This is how I'm gonna get a, this is how I'm gonna get along in this world. You know, when something doesn't feel right, I'm gonna smoke a joint. You know, if I'm insecure and I'm uncomfortable, I'm gonna take a drink. Right? So it essentially became a solution for me, you know, that backfired. You know, and, and that's really what I want to stress on you guys. You know, I was just experimenting at that time. I had no clue where this ride was going to go. No clue. Now, that, now, on the outside looking in, you know, you would have thought I was living a great life. You know, I had everything I want. You know, I, I, I dressed well. I did great in sports. My grades were actually good, guys. I graduated high school with a 3.5 GPA, you know, and then got, a, got an opportunity to play college football at the next level. And, you know, through high school... The, the drugs and alcohol, it became almost like daily. You know, smoking pot daily, um, drinking on the weekends, sometimes drinking during the weeks. You know, even at that time, you know, I'm 16 years old, driving drunk behind a wheel. You know, I mean, fortunate that I didn't kill somebody. You know, I mean, there were many nights that, you know, I'm, I'm driving and I, like, I can't even see where I'm going. You know, how I'm sitting here today, I don't know. The only thing I could say is it's grace. And as you guys get older, I encourage you to look up two words. Grace and humility. And, uh, you know, that'll come on as you guys get a little older. Um, so I, so I, get to, I get to college, and um, harder drugs started to come into play. And I can tell you that even though I got this great opportunity, you know, to play football at the next level, by the time I got to college, I no longer wanted anything to do with sports. I could care less about a career. You know, I was going to pursue drugs and that lifestyle and indulge as much as I can. So harder drugs started to come in, cocaine, um, ecstasy, LSD. Um, you know, I was doing, I, you know, something I forgot to share in the, the group earlier. I was doing a lot of uh, this drug called ketamine, you know, which is called Special K. I was doing that. And that's that's a, like a, a cat tranquilizer. You know, it's crazy the things that we put in our system, you know, just to fit in and feel good. Um, you know, so I, my, after my first year at Waynesburg, which is where I, you know, went to play uh, college football, you know, I lost my opportunity. And I kind of just floundered around in Morgantown, West Virginia, um, where WVU was, because a lot of my classmates had went down there. A lot of my, at that time, you know, fellow partiers, if you will, you know, went to school. And um, so I get down there, and, uh, you know, a year went by, and then, I, you know, I was partying every day. Um, close calls, run-ins with the law, and I, uh, you know, I finally had gotten myself into this little junior college, and, and I managed to get out with a, you know, a two-year degree, right? And, um, you know, still, you know, no introduction yet. I mean, you know, I had seen a couple of my friends, and when I say a couple, I mean a few, were, st were starting to get into heroin. Even at that time in my life, I was almost kind of like cautious to be around. You know, it was, it was kind of a drug that scared me at, at some point or to some respect, and uh, so I had come home, and I got my wisdom teeth pulled, and it was a, just at a little dentist office in Steubenville, Ohio, and I remember uh, I got my wisdom teeth pulled, and I got 30 Vicodin, right, and, you know, I, I had taken a painkiller, you know, here and there. I mean, I could probably count, you know, maybe five times in a year I've done it, and for whatever reason, you know, I, uh, I was back at my parents' house looking for a job, kind of just felt down and out, just kind of just didn't feel right, right? But I knew that Vicodin was a substance, and I knew I could abuse it. So I took all 30 the first day, right? 
and I got, you know, I got loaded. And um, so I went back the next day, lied to the doctor, got 30 more. I did that like four times to the point where, you know, the doctor finally was like, y you're done, buddy, you know. So a day after that, you know, I had no more Vicodin, right? And you mind, I had only done this four, four days in a row. I started to feel like almost like flu-like symptoms, just like a little off. And I was at one of my buddy's house whom, whom I knew was starting to get into heroin. And uh, he threw a bag of heroin my way. He was like, dude, that'll help you. You know, it'll make you feel a little bit better. And so I snorted it. And it did. It made me feel great. And uh, I went back to that guy's house for six months every day and bought a bag of heroin. And it was almost like I just, like, like I'd lost time. You know, and, and up to that point, I had no concept. You know, I had knowledge of hangovers. You know, you know, partying so hard that you're just exhausted the next day. But I had no concept of a physical addiction, right? And it's six months into it, it just it dawns on me. It's like I'm, it's got its hooks in me, you know. And uh, so I got, I got scared. And, uh, you know, I talked to my, my mother and father and my girlfriend at that time, and I went to my first detox, right? And, you know, I went to detox, and, and I got separated from, you know, all the harmful substances, and they gave me a, a set of certain things to do to be successful going forward, and I did none of them, you know, because I was Mr. Intelligent. You know, I, I could think my way out of anything, you know, and, and, and that's the thing. You know, people that, you know, grow up that get addictive problems, it doesn't mean you're, you're not intelligent, right? You're just up against something way bigger than you, you know? And something that I did at the, in, you know, the class earlier is I want, I want all of you to take a look to the classmate to the left and to the right of you, you know, because reality is, is that person might not graduate with you. They might be dead. Reality is, now don't break your necks, guys, all right? You know, that, that, that person sitting to the left or right of you, that person, you know, might not graduate college. You know, that person might make one bad choice, as Mr. Little said, and he might die. And that's, that's the reality of it. You know, so I get out of this detox. Two weeks later, I walk into a friend's house, wrong place, wrong time. I see my two friends that I didn't know were using drugs intravenously. And I, and I saw it, and I wanted to do it, and I did it. And it took me on a, a, another ride. And something that I forgot to share about in the group previously is some of the common themes with, like, any type of addiction is this word. It's called desperation right? I can assure you that I learned right and wrong that stealing was wrong, robbing people was wrong, lying was wrong. I learned all those things, guys. You know what I mean? Once I got this physical addiction, I'm injecting heroin into my veins every day, not knowing, you know, stealing from people, you know, lying, manipulating. You know, I, I remember being at a point in my life where I just was able to get enough money to get a fix that day right, but I had, no, I had no needle, right, and I was at a friend's house at the corner of my street, and he only had one needle, and I was so desperate, and I was sick, and I remember him using the needle, and I, and, and I, I couldn't even take the time to clean it, and I remember watching his blood go into my bloodstream, right, I don't know if that was the time, but, you know, through that, fortunately, you know, there's a lot of things that you can get out there. You know, obviously, HIV, AIDS, you know, you know and, and I say this, I was fortunate. You know, I acquired hepatitis C. I don't have it today, God willing. I had to go through a grueling six-month treatment, almost common, you know, with like chemo therapy. I had to do that in my recovery when I was 31 years old after I would found out I was going to be a father for the first time. But that's, that's what this does to you guys. You know, and I was the guy that sat in your seats and listened to people just like me and said, it won't happen to me, you know, because I grew up in a good family, you know, and my parents have money, you know, and, 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 I, and, I, and, I, and I have good look. All this stuff, you know, that absolutely does nothing to keep you from addiction. So, so I start, you know, on this downward spiral, and, um, you know, so uh, it was like 2005, you know, my, uh, actually my wife at that time, she was done, left. Um, and, and good for her. You know, she, she deserved the life that I couldn't give her. And um, so I'm with my, you know, one of my childhood best friends who's not with us anymore, and, and I'll get into that. Um, so we're, we're up in the north side of Pittsburgh, not a good area, you know, and, and we're, we're, we're getting heroin, okay? And um, 
So we're com- so I'm driving. I'm driving a Nissan Xterra. We're coming back through the pit, the Fort Pitt tunnels, and um, you know I look over, and I know he's getting ready to you know push it, push it in his veins, and he does that you know right as we get out of the Fort Pitt tunnels, and uh, right around the Green Tree exit, heading back to Robinson, he goes out. Right, and I never seen anybody overdose. Um, heard about it, you know. It was definitely one of those guys, you know. And, and as he was, never happened to me. I'm smart. I'm safe. You know, I'm a safe heroin addict. You know, they the, they don't exist, guys. Safe heroin addicts don't exist. So, I didn't know what to do. My car at the time had a governor on it. I don't know if you guys know what a governor is, but a governor is put on certain cars to where, like, once you hit like 90 miles an hour, like your car will just shut down. You know, you can't go any faster than 90. So, you know, I wasn't real from even though I was, you know, I grew up around the Pittsburgh area, I wasn't real familiar with, like, where all the hospitals were or what to do at that time, but I, I, I knew he was dying. And um, so I thought I was either going to have to turn around and go back through the tunnels to UPMC or I was going to have to hightail it to Weirton, right? So, so I made this decision. I'm going to hightail it to Weirton. And, and I, you know, I'm, I'm flying down 376, and I get off at Robinson to get on 22 to head back to West Virginia, and I look over, and I was like, he's not going to make it. He's not going to make it. And I pull off on the first exit, which is the Tony Dale. And I pull off, and at the end of the exit ramp, there was a BP gas station. And my mind was like, I'm going to get him on ice or, or try something. Um, well, anyhow, there's two cops sitting there, right? So my friend at the time was on uh, federal paper, which is parole. You know, he had gotten, you know, he had gotten a, a serious charge. So my mind was like, well, I can't go there, you know, because at that time, you know, especially the life that I lived, you know, obviously, you know, co- cops weren't, you know, exactly my best friend at the time. So I go over the overpass over to where there's that, like, ice cream parlor on the other side, and there just happened to be a paramedic sitting there eating lunch. Just happened to be. So, like, I look back now, and, and that, that, those are miracles that started to happen in my life. You know, something was trying to wake me up. And so that was the first time I ever seen Narcan administered, brought him back to life right in front of me. Um, three months later, me and him are down in Charleston, West Virginia, uh, just got kicked out of another treatment center. You know, I, I, I walk into a house uh, a little bit late, and uh, he's gone. You know, I still remember what, what was on the bags. You know, it, was, it said toxic. You know, and that's what addiction does. You lose all sense of rational thinking. You know, think that I'm going to put some stuff in my body that says toxic in it. You know, and, and I'm going to do that, and my mind's going to tell me this is a good thing to do. So, you know, I, uh, I ended up, uh, you know, kind of going on a downward spiral. Um, I, I, was, I had an involuntary commitment put on me. I weighed 130 pounds. You know, I hadn't eaten anything in 10 days. You know, I go back to another treatment center. And, guys, I finally had kind of caught some zest with, like, okay, like, I don't know what to do here. You know, I'm 26 years old. I don't know what to do. So I finally, instead of letting people who had been there before kind of guide me in my life, and I put, put a couple of years together. I got a good job in a union. And, um, you know, and I want to just quickly talk about, you know, anybody that in, in the recovery field, you know, we have to exercise vigilance. You know, so, you know, just because now I sit here now with eight and a half years clean, clean and sober. I don't drink. I don't do minor mood-altering substances. I don't smoke cigarettes anymore. Um, and I don't chew tobacco. You know, so, and those are the things that I want my four-year-old son and my five-year-old daughter to grow up around, you know, because I definitely believe that, although it's not the only answer, I do believe that um, you can increase or you can cut down on the risk of addiction if you create a good household for your children. I don't think it's going to solve the problem, but I think it helps. Um, So I found myself out of position at, at age 28 in Charleston, you know, from a recovering perspective and, uh, Next thing you know, I'm using again. Another year and a half of misery, and I land in Florida, all right? That was March 31st, 2010. That was the last time I ever used anything. Since then, you know, I have uh, a beautiful fiance that I've been with eight years. We have two beautiful children. She's also a recovering person. You know, she's from uh, the state of New Jersey, and we met down in Florida. Um, I, I work in substance abuse now, and I have for almost eight years, and uh, my life, guys, is absolutely amazing. What I could share with you is there is a road you could take to get success and happiness in this world a lot easier if you just listen to people. I'm telling you, 
just the, the, that, that, that experimentation that you guys might get into could possibly take you down a road that might lead to the grave, to a jail cell, or to just complete misery. One last thing that I'll leave you guys with is uh, two years ago, two years ago, 38-year-old friend of mine, uh, his name was Tommy Matuszewski, he's from upstate New York. This guy was just a blessing in my life. And he had, you know, he had five years clean, and then he had relapsed, and then he had put two years clean together. And um, he was working for me at the time. And uh, he, had an, he had a 12-year-old autistic boy, and he relapsed one time, guys, one time. He thought he was snorting cocaine, which by all respects, you know, people in that, in that world, cocaine's not going to kill you, right? He snorted carfentanil. Carfentanil is like 100 or 1,000 times stronger than fentanyl. Like literally three grains will kill you. He's gone, guys. He's gone. You know, no more. He doesn't have an opportunity to wake up and say, Mom, I'm sorry for hurting you. Mom, I'm sorry for taking that, that, that check from you. Dad, I'm sorry for hitting you. You know, he doesn't have an opportunity to make things right. You know, so, guys... I'm telling you, alcohol and drugs, you're going to hear it throughout your, your lives. You know, some of you guys are going to listen. Some of you guys aren't. You know what I mean? But wherever you find yourself, there's always a better way. Just don't be afraid to ask for help. That's all I got. Thank you. All right.